We're going to continue in our series with truth, fact, and then we added lies to the series because I thought that was very important to go over. And lies of the enemy, that's because Jesus in John 8, 44 called Satan the father of lies. And um, he, I, I mentioned this, that I don't like spending too much time focusing on Satan, um, even though I do believe we're supposed to teach on him, we're supposed to learn about him, because Apostle Paul said very clearly, do not be wary or ignorant of the enemy's devices or his traps. Don't be ignorant of, of the enemy. However, unfortunately, a lot of, of Christians, a lot of churches put their emphasis and their focus on Satan. So much so that they're actually focusing more on Satan than they are on Jesus. And that's not good. Okay? That actually opens you up for attack um, and opens you up for all kinds of things. I remember there was a time in my Christian life that I was really focused on the enemy, very, very, um, in getting into fear, and I was getting attacked a lot by the enemy. I could see his, his hand a lot in my life as far as um, uh, just being messed with, you know. So I want to encourage you that our focus is not always on Satan. However, we do need to know, we do need to know our enemy, okay? We do need to know his devices because we can be tricked, we can be fooled. I mean, so... Uh, just a little bit of a review. Um, <clears throat> Satan is the father of lies. Just a little bit of a backdrop. He was an archangel. Before his name was Satan, his name was Lucifer. And he was a worship leader in heaven. He led worship. And some believe that he actually had musical instruments coming out of his body. You know, he was just very musical and very beautiful to behold. Um, probably the most beautiful angel that God ever created at that point. And... Um, so he had a lot of pride. There was a lot of pride there. And even Isaiah, it says that he was talking, <clears throat> and he says he wanted to exalt his throne above the throne of God. And we see that very clearly in, in, in Matthew chapter 4, what we went over. So, <clears throat> and, it's very, and he was jealous of mankind. I personally believe that. He wanted to destroy mankind because mankind is in the image of God. He is not in the image of God. No angel is in the image of God. So... He wanted to destroy mankind because he hated God, and we were in the image of God. And he did so through, through, um, through uh, trickery, basically, through um, manipulation. Got Eve to question. We went over that. Got Eve to question her identity. Got her to think that she wasn't already like God. It's like, well, you'll be like, you're really not like God right now, but you'll be like him if you eat this fruit. He doesn't want you to be like him because he knows that you'll... You know, he's, so he got, he got Eve to, to question her identity and to think God is not good and to think that God is withholding something. So we went over that. And then we went over 1 John 2.16 and it talks about all sin. All sin is of the world and, and, the, and you can basically break it down into three categories. Actually, let's go there. 1 John 2.16, if you have your Bibles. 1 John 2.16, <clears throat> and it says, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So those are the exact same three things that Eve was tempted with, and the exact same three things that Jesus was tempted with in the wilderness, what we went over last week. Um, Eve was, it says that she, she saw that the fruit was pleasing to the eye, or saw that the fruit was good for food and pleasing to the eye. So there's the lust of the flesh, lust of the eye, and it says, and it says that she saw that it was desirable to make one wise. There's the pride of life. And then, so those are three things that Satan comes at us with. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. You can categorize all sin into that into those three main areas. Anything that we've done wrong, sin, is, is one of those three things. So Eve, Adam and Eve failed. They failed miserably. Okay, right away, they, they ate of the fruit. They believed the lie. Satan, however, I mean, Jesus, however, did not. He totally, hands down, defeated Satan and his temptations. So that's what we're, that's what we're, uh, we're going to look at again today. However, we're going to look at it through Luke chapter 4. It, there's two accounts of the temptation of Christ, his, his temptation in the wilderness. And Luke gives a, it's a different perspective. Um, and, and a lot of you may have uh, wondered in the past, <clears throat> why, 
why four Gospels? At least that's something I've always... Why not what, just one big Gospel? You know what I mean? It would have made things a lot easier. Um, <laughs> I think... And then somebody really explained it. How many of you ever heard of... Uh, oh gosh, Case for Christ. Lee Strobel. How many of you ever heard of Lee Strobel? Yeah, he's, he's an excellent, just analytical thinker. And um, he broke it down like this, and I really appreciated it. <clears throat> Was if you were in a courtroom, and every witness... Every witness that came to describe an event that occurred, if every witness gave the same exact story, they would be, they would be charged with collusion, right? They, they got together and they planned out their story. Hey, these got a match. However, if you had four witnesses that were trying to explain an event in a courtroom, I've noticed a lot of my analogies have to do with courtrooms and jails. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought of that. I got, I got to rethink that. Anyway, we'll stick with this one today. Um, if, if four different people were trying to explain an event, a crime, and it all, it all sounded the same, they would be like, hey, this is collusion. They've gotten together and they've figured this out. Okay, something's not right. But if, they, if the four people were trying to explain a crime, they, they explained different angles. It was a little bit different story, but, it, but the major points ma matched up and each one added its own different kind of twist. You would say, well, they didn't get together and talk about how they're going to say this. Everything's adding up. It was just a different perspective because we all see things differently. You know what I mean? So you wouldn't charge them with collusion. And that's why you have the four Gospels. A lot of times they, they are. Um, for example, I was studying out in Matthew, the temptation, and Luke, the temptation. There are a lot of differences. Okay? It's, it's, they're not contrary. That's what's awesome about the Bible. They don't conflict one another. It's not a flat-out difference. But it's like, it's like seeing it from four different perspectives. Luke has a different perspective of what happened. Matthew has a different perspective. We all, none of us are exactly the same. We all see things differently. We do. One thing that I'm, like if we, if we were all to look back at that painting back there, we would all explain it a little differently, wouldn't we? We would all see something a little differently. Well, that's exactly why we have the Gospels, so that we can have a different perspective. And I personally... Everyone may have their favorite gospel. I personally take to John the most. Some of you may have noticed that. Um, I, I relate to John the most as far as how he breaks things down. He breaks things down on a love level. See, Luke, a lot of you may take to Luke. He's very methodical, okay, very broken down. He was a doctor. He was a physician, uh, very analytical, um, <clears throat> and it's very, very systematic, broken down, um, so, so, so there's, different, there's definitely different perspectives. So anyway, we're going to look at this, the, the same thing except from a different perspective. And there are different, there are different things that we're going to go over in, in his temptation. So we're going to start at verse 1, and we have Luke 4 up here for you. <clears throat> then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. See, Matthew says at the end of 40 days, Satan came to him. It doesn't say that he wasn't tempted for 40 days. So there's where you have to, have to um, put some thought into it. So it says here that he was tempted for 40 days. That's a long time to be tempted. <clears throat> Remember I talked about before this, right before this, Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist. He came out of the water and God the Father said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Okay, so, so the very first thing that God, God, God just basically said to everyone, this is, this is my son, okay? So the very first thing Satan attacked was Jesus' sonship, right? We're going to read uh, verse 2, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. And in those days he ate nothing. And afterward, when, he had, when they had ended, he was hungry. And the devil said to him, if you are the son of God. So we'll stop right there, that, so the same exact thing he was doing to Eve, he was trying to do to Jesus. And we're going to actually just um, stay on that for a minute. We didn't really get into depth last, last, sir, last Sunday on identity. Um, see, what Satan was, he was, not only was he getting Jesus to question his identity, he was getting, trying to get Jesus to prove his identity. See, we don't have to prove our, our identity. God already proved Jesus' identity. He said, you are my beloved son. He didn't say, if you, if you can defeat Satan in the wilderness, you're my beloved son. 
If you can do A, B, C, and D, you're my beloved son. He already said it. So that's, that's a major attack you will face. So that's what we're going to kind of talk about today is uh, um, <clears throat> what to expect. What to expect from the enemy. And he will attack your identity, who you are. That's, that's so many people. How many of you ever have dealt with uh, um, identity, uh, identity theft? How many of you have ever dealt with that? Well, pray. That it's, yeah, it stinks. And I'm sorry for stealing your identity. No, just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. Um, it stinks, okay? But the first identity theft came at the garden when he got Eve, Adam and Eve to, to give up their identity. God got them to, st- get, he stole it from them. So that's <clears throat> what the enemy will come to do. He'll get you to believe that, that you're, you're somebody that God doesn't love. You're somebody that, that you got to try to earn God's approval, God's favor. But you know what God says? Your identity is secure in him. When you've received Jesus, your, your identity is in him. Your identity is in Christ. You have a new identity. You don't, Satan will try to get you to relate to your natural self, who you are in the natural, and your natural abilities, and say, you're, you're not, how are you a born-again Christian? Here's one of your identities, and so this may, I don't know if I've ever shared this, but did you know that we are all saints? We are all, if, you're, if you've received Jesus, you are a saint. That's what the Bible says. You're a saint, it calls you a saint. It calls you a king and a priest. It calls you the Lord's beloved. It, all these things, all these things are your name. But see, see, Satan will try to get you to think, no, you're not these things. You, look at you. You're, you're, you're your mistakes. You're your past failures. Or you're, you're, you're um, what, what others said about you. You're a, you're a failure. You're no good. Maybe, maybe as a child you were told, you're no good. You always screw up. See, that's not your identity. Your identity is in Christ. You have a new identity. So don't, don't, don't let the enemy steal your identity. Protect yourself. A lot of, a lot of times people have, uh, when, to protect against identity theft, they have certain passwords and things you can do on your computer and with your bank. You know what, you know what our identity, what helps us against identity theft? Let's take a guess. Jesus, yes, very good. And Jesus is? The Word. The Word, very good. Jesus is the Word. The Word protects you against Satan's identity theft. Okay, very simple but very profound to think about. Um, He can steal your identity through what the world thinks about you. He really can. He tried to do it to Jesus, didn't work. It did not work. Because He is the Word. Remember, He kept on saying it is written. It is written. He kept on going back to the word. And he did and 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 Satan did the same thing in the garden. He twisted God's word. He says, Has God did God really say that you will surely die? He twists God's word. He tried to twist twist God's word to Jesus, but Jesus wasn't having any of it, remember? Jesus because because he wrote the word, he is the word. That was very arrogant of Satan to try to try to use the word against the word himself. So, don't let the enemy steal your identity. The word of God tells you your identity. Why is it important to know identity? Because it's, it's your security. A lot of people struggle with identity, especially younger people. They're trying to find out who they are. They're trying to find out, you know, where do I fit in? And then, and then they, they, they pick an identity, they, or, they, or they, they identify with someone or something and then that, that takes them right into old age. That, that one thing they stick with. A lot of people, their identity is in their job. Their, their identity is, well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a construction worker. And I do this. And I'm a, I, I provide for society. And then when they retire, they've lost their identity. A lot of people, they don't know what to do when they retire. When they, when they, or they lose their job or something like that. A lot of people, their identity is with their spouse. You know, well, I'm, I'm so-and-so, and I'm, I'm married to so-and-so. I'm, I'm, I'm the husband or wife of so-and-so, and they ident- that's their identity. And if they get a divorce or that person dies, it's like, ah, I've lost my identity. I've lost who I am. A lot of people, I mean, you, I could go on and on about what people identify with. And those, we, it's very important we don't 
put our identity in those things, in what we do or what's been done to us or what, what, what has circumstances, what have happened to us. It's very crucial we put our identity in Christ. He is our identity. Okay, God sees us through Christ. I've said that many times, and we need to see God through Christ. It's, he's the ultimate mediator. Not only, not only is he a mediator for, for us to God, but he's also a mediator for God to us. So it, it, we need to see ourselves through the lens that God sees us, and that is through Jesus. I mean, so, so what would be a practical example of your identity? Taking the word of God, like what I just said. The, the, your identity is that you are healed. You're the Lord's beloved. You're precious to him. You, you are full of his grace. You're anointed. Those are, there's so, much, so many things you could go over with identity. You, you're, you're, you have favor. That's part of your identity. You're a son or a daughter of God. That's part of your identity. You've been redeemed. You're, you're not cursed. That's part of you. See, a lot of these things are going to have to go with your identity. Don't identify with, with things of the world or things that Satan tries to get you to identify with. So that's what Jesus, that's what Satan tried to do to Jesus. If you are the Son of God, command this stone to become bread. So he's saying, prove it. Prove that you are the Son of God. And, and Jesus is like, I don't have to prove it. I don't have to. God already proved it for me. He already proved it for me. See, God already proved that you are a son or a daughter. All you had to do was receive. That's all you had to do. So, <clears throat> but Jesus answered him saying, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word of God. So just kind of a side trail, man does not live by just natural substance, but by every word of God, because we are created by the word of God. Uh, verse 5, Then the devil, taking him up on a high mountain, showed him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. So there it goes along with what we were talking about last week. I believe this explains it better. Luke, Matthew explains some parts better. Luke explains other parts better. But he said a moment of time. So he was showing them all the kingdoms, all the kingdoms of all time. <clears throat> and the devil said to him, all this authority I will give you and their glory, for this has been delivered to me and I give it to whom I wish. So there's a lot in that. <clears throat> all this authority, that's what Jesus came to win back, right? Was authority. God could not come to earth and, and get it back as God. He couldn't. Remember, we've talked about that. I don't know when that was. It was around Christmas last year, or a little bit after. I don't remember exactly, but God could not come back and get authority back for man as, as just God, God the Father. Okay? <clears throat> if he did, he would have had to kill everyone because he's just. And he's, he's, he's full of justice. However, the, the only way that it could be done is if a man did it, if a man won back authority. So that's why God came as a man. He knew that's, that's what he had to do. He had to win back authority as a man. So he became the God-man, took on the body of a man. He's still God, 100% God. Didn't, didn't lose part of his Godhead when he became a man. He just took on the body of a man and will forever have the body of a man in heaven. He didn't always. That's profound to me. He didn't always have the body of a man up in heaven. He was still God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. But God the Son came to earth, took on the body of a man, and, and took on the sin of the world, the judgment of the world, the sickness of the world, died on the cross, rose from the dead, and now sits at the right hand of the Father with the body of a man. And that's how we can relate to him now. That's how we have access to him now. Before we didn't. It was access through the law and through prophets and through, through ceremony, through the temple. Now... Now, that body, the body of a man, now that's our access to the Father. He's our mediator. This little side trail. But the devil taking him up, <clears throat> I'm sorry, and the devil said to him, all this authority I will give to you. So Jesus came back to win authority, so, Jesus, so Satan's offering him a shortcut. Remember, we talked about that last week. He's like, here it is. You don't have to go to the cross. You don't have to take on all this shame, all this punishment. Jesus knew he was going to have to do that. He's like, hey, 
I'll give it all to you right now. And Satan offers shortcuts. He does. There's a lot of shortcuts out there. And their glory, this has been delivered to me and I will give to whom I wish. How has it been delivered to him? From Adam. Adam delivered it to him. Therefore, if you will worship before me, all will be yours. So Satan was trying to get him to worship. That is, that is sick. That really is sick. Trying to get God to worship you. The one who created you to worship you. And that's where he's at. That that's, to me is there's no, there's no redemption. I mean, there's no redemption for Satan. There is no forgiveness. There is no help. He is absolutely, totally, 100% judged and damned. And he knows it. So, um, the, uh, verse 8, And Jesus answered said to him, Get behind me, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only you shall serve. So, what he just went through there, I believe that was lust of the eyes. The first one, when Satan said, Command that these, this stone be turned into bread, that was lust of the flesh, right? Because he was very hungry, trying to get his flesh to submit. The ver next one was he was, uh, took him to a high place and showed him all the kingdoms in time, showed him and all, all the kingdoms and all their glory. That's lust of the eyes, right? And then this next one is the pride of life. Uh, then he brought him to Jerusalem, set him on the pinnacle of the temple, and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it is written, He shall give his angels charge over you to keep you. And again, he didn't quote all of the verse. And in their hands they shall bear you up, lest you dash your foot against a stone. And Jesus answered and said to him, It has been said. What's the difference? First he said it has been written, right? First two times said it has been written. Now he says it has been said. That's interesting to think about. You shall not tempt the Lord your God. So, <clears throat> this last one is the pride of life. So remember how Eve was tempted with those three things and Adam? They were tempted with lust of, the, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Well, these three exact things Jesus was tempted with. However, he won. Praise God. He had to go through this. He had to go through this showdown where, where, where Adam and Eve fell, the last Adam had to have victory. And he did. That's why it said in the very first verse of John 4 that um, the Spirit led him into the wilderness. And Matthew says that the Spirit led him to be tempted. That's the only time that the Spirit's done that. Uh, the Spirit does not tempt people. It says that, that, that God cannot tempt people. But he led him to be tempted. He led him into the battle. Because he had to do it. If he wouldn't have done this, he wouldn't have had victory. I believe. And this was the first part. This was before he did any miracles, before he ministered to anyone. This had to be established. He had to have d dominion over the enemy. And he did. He truly did. If he would have failed, we would all have been doomed. We would all be doomed. We wouldn't be here today if he would have failed. We, would, we wouldn't exist if he would have failed because God would have destroyed the earth. <laughs> so, praise God. <clears throat> so that's what we're going to... We didn't get to get through everything today. We kind of took some rabbit trails, but that's good. We're kind of, it was kind of like a, a review mixed with some new stuff, looking at new perspective. But I would encourage you to, to look at Luke 4 um, and look at Jesus' response. He stood his ground and he was firm, but we notice he wasn't trying to battle Satan with wits, even though he's much smarter than Satan. He was, he, he, he was battling him with the word of God. That's what we use. That is, our, that is our weaponry. And actually, Ephesians, it calls the word of God the sword of the spirit. It's actually a sword. Uh, Ephesians, the armor of God. And Ephesians 6, is it? <clears throat> Let's look at that for a minute. Ephesians 6. Ver see Ephesians 6, uh, 13. Well, I'm going to verse, let's go to verse 12. Or verse 11. Ephesians 6, 11. Put on the whole armor of God, that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, the tricks. So that's what it's saying. Put on the armor of God. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. So it's saying our war is not against natural things, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Whether you believe it or not, we are in a spiritual war. We are, there is war going on all around us right now. A war, and, and because we don't see it, a lot of times we're oblivious to it. 
Okay, but it is taking place. The enemy, Satan, there are, there are demons out there that lie to people, get them to think that this stuff isn't real, that, that you know, don't worry about this. Don't, don't really think about it a whole lot. It's, it's very real. <clears throat> Verse 13, Therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able... Okay, I read that. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth. Remember we were talking a lot about truth. Girded your waist with truth. Having put on the breastplate of righteousness and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace, above all, taking the shield of faith with which you, are, you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. So notice the sword is really the only offensive weapon. We have a shield, we have a breastplate, we have a, a belt, we have you know, our feet are shodded with the preparation of the gospel of peace, but the, the sword is the only offensive weapon, and that's what we fight the enemy with. That's what we combat him with, is what the Word says. Okay? Like I said last week, in yourself, you are no match for Satan. You, are, you aren't. You're, you're no match for him. Because he's been here a lot longer than you have. He knows man. He knows how to tempt them and how to frustrate them. and He knows what to do. Okay? You are no match for him. However... When you know the Word of God and stand on the Word of God, He is no match for you because you're fighting with God now. Taking His Word, standing on His Word. He cannot come against the Word of God. The Word of God has authority over Him. He knows it. He's subject to it. That's why demons, demons came to Him and bowed. They bowed down. They weren't worshiping Him, but they were subject to Him. And they would plead with Him. Don't Like when He, when he cast uh, those demons into the pigs. Does anyone recall that? The, the, the first, the person came to him and then said, please don't send us into the abyss, but permit that we may be cast into those pigs. And, and they, were, they were pleading with him. And they even, I think they even said to him, oh, they called him the son of God or something like that. But um, they are subject. They, they, the word of God has authority over them. So fight with the word of God. When you're hearing lies, when, when you feel the enemy attacking, when you feel that 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 heaviness, take the Word of God and stand on the Word of God. It's very powerful. I want to encourage you. We're, I'm going to go ahead and end in prayer. <clears throat> but I want to encourage you to, um, like I said, Pat, Nina, myself, um, we would love to pray with you if you have any prayer concerns. And it, it's for anything. We just want to agree with you. We're family. And don't be ashamed if there's anything that you're, you're thinking of right now, a person you want to pray for, yourself, family member, so on. Just, just come up. We'd love to pray. Okay? Father, we come into agreement. We thank you for the power of the Holy Spirit. We thank you for the truth. And we do not have to put up with the lies of the enemy. Thank you that we do not have to have our identity stolen. But our identity is in you. In Christ. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you that we have your word, which is the sword of the Spirit. And we can combat the enemy and put him at bay with your word, which is absolute power. We thank you now for your presence and for your peace in Jesus' name. Amen.